Well, it is a joy to be with you guys again uh, this weekend. Happy Independence Day weekend. Also to our friends to the north, happy Canada Day. Any Canadians? Um, If you have your Bibles, uh, will you go with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Uh, We will begin reading there in verse 1. Um, Also, if you don't mind, would you stand for the reading of God's word? Uh, We won't leave you hanging. We'll have it up on the screen for you if you want to follow along. Uh, I'll be reading from the NIV version. And I'm going to read quite a few verses, so you guys just hang with me for a little bit. Starting in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And Paul concludes this 13th chapter in the 13th verse by saying, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You may be seated. I would love to tag this text this weekend with the title, Love, colon, The More Excellent Way. Love, The More Excellent Way. I didn't know how or where to particularly start this message this weekend. I mean, we're talking about love, so there are a lot of different places that we can go. But my mind went to love songs. I thought that that was a place maybe that was common ground for us to start. And in particular, when I first started thinking about this message and and praying um, about what I would share uh, a song popped in my head that, was, that came out in, in 1987, a 19-year-old by the name of James Todd Smith. Some of you may know him as LL Cool J, short for Ladies Love Cool James. But LL Cool J penned one of the most popular rap ballads of all time. Notice I use the word rap and ballad together, which is not really uh, how they're known, but this is why the song I Need Love was one of the most popular songs in the 80s. And I remember how the song went and how it started, and, and it went a little something like this. When I'm alone in my room, sometimes I stare at the wall. In the back of my mind, I hear my conscience call, telling me I need a girl that's as sweet as a dove. For the first time in my life, I see I need love. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh man. I can keep going, but I won't. Um, now, obviously, LL Cool J, he's 19 years old, so he's got a very narrow view of love. He's connecting love to to a girl, which maybe many of us did at that time, uh, a girl or a guy. Uh, But but as I thought about like the different love songs, um, they, they, they stand out in my mind as being very similar, very, very narrow view, not necessarily a holistic view of love, but mainly about romanticism or or some deep infatuation. And they they're related to some experience directed at a person or a thing um, that, that is the center of their particular world or their experience at that particular time. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, it's just, it's just not a holistic view of it. But then I also just started thinking about all of these different love songs, these classic 
love songs uh, over the years. Uh, you think about the 70s and the Partridge family, uh, I Think I Love You, or how about uh, Love Roller Coaster by the Ohio Players? Yeah. Roller Coaster! Yeah. Uh, oh, y'all know that one, all right. Uh, then, then, then you got in the 80s, you have I Just Called to Say I Love You, Stevie Wonder, you know? Or oh, 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 Whitney Houston, the greatest love of all. Then in the 90s, Michael Bolton, when a man loves a woman. How about, how about that one? Or, or, or Janet Jackson's That's the Way Love Goes. Then in, in the 2000s, uh, you're Crazy in Love by Beyonce, one of the most popular love songs in that decade. And then for my country music folks, uh, uh, Lady Antebellum, Need You Now. Not that I know much about country. So don't, so don't be too impressed, you know. I, I just wanted to diversify the list a little bit, you know. But, but I, think, I, think, I think these songs are really a reflection of how we view love. I, I, I do. I think uh, we tend to romanticize love in our, in our mind. And this, this kind of love is really uh, characterized in a, in a Greek word called eros, love. It's, it's a romantic love or sexual love. And, and I started thinking about how we process love. And I, I, I think at the forefront of our minds that that, that is maybe how we primarily process it. And when I started thinking about that kind of processing, I, thought, I started thinking about uh, the limbic system of our brain, which is also known as the lizard brain. And it's, and it's called the lizard brain because a lizard has just about that much brain, and we're, we have that same uh, kind of brain as well. But we also have expanded portion of our brain where we can be creative and we can analyze and all those sorts of things. But the, the lizard brain is primarily focused on how can I feed myself how can I protect myself? How can I pleasure myself? Change, vulnerability, risk, these are things to be avoided. And it's primarily focused on survival and self-preservation. And I, I, I think, as I think about these songs and I think about how I see us characterize love in our society, I, I, I think we are primarily characterizing love through the lizard brain. I think the world that we live in is, is most, most often approaches love this way. I can give you a perfect example. If I don't like what I'm seeing or I'm not feeling this, I swipe left, right? I mean, that's not, a, that's not a knock on anyone who is on Tinder or uses that date app or any of those, those sorts of things. But, but it is a depiction of how we think about love, how we interact with people, conflict, perseverance or stuff we don't like. We just move on to the next option, right? It's a very consumeristic approach to love and how we deal with people. But I started thinking more about some of these songs and I thought of another song that I, I, I kind of really feel like sets us up for what we want to talk about tonight. And it's, it's a song uh, by Kurt Franklin in a group called God's Property yeah. called Love. And, and there's, there's a couple of lines in the song where uh, at the beginning it says, love, a word that comes and goes. But few people really know what it means to really love somebody. Then they go on to say, you show me, Jesus, what it really means to love. See, when the lizard brain is primarily driving and is our primary perspective. It, it keeps us from understanding this holistic view of love that God has for us. Kurt Franklin is saying Jesus is what makes the difference. And Jesus creates a new point of reference for love, and it overrides the lizard brain thinking. It's the kind of love that goes beyond you as the sole benefactor. And outside of a relationship with Jesus, not only is our point of reference off, but, our lack, but we lack the capacity to sustain unconditional love. And see, I think Paul realized this disconnect that was going on in the church at Corinth. And so just, just let me give you a little background on what's going on in, in Corinth before we dive into what we're going to talk about uh, this weekend. Paul is, is writing to the church at, at Corinth 
Um, and Corinth is about 50, 51 miles west of, of Athens, so, so pretty, pretty similar proximity of D.C. and, and Baltimore. And uh, it was a place of great trade, a place of, of, of great wealth and affluence. But it also had a little bit of a reputation of a city uh, known for its, its carnality and its pride. But Paul was able to successfully plant a church there and labored there for almost two years. Now he's away and, and he's writing an appeal for submission to biblical instruction and the Holy Spirit. Basically, he's doing this because the Corinthians have allowed the culture and the customs to influence how they live out and reflect the gospel instead of allowing the gospel to reflect a more excellent way. In many ways, I think Corinth could be compared to the D.C. area, you know, a place of great affluence and influence. Could be likened to a trade city where many people are passing through and, and there is some transience. But like Corinth, we also have a high intellect. We also have a philosophical debate mainly around government and policy. I believe we see examples as in Corinth also where we have self-identified Christians taking on the culture and the customs of, of this area or, or this country as in terms of how we reflect the gospel. Insert as an example, social media. We don't even need to unpack that. Y'all know what I mean. You, ha you all have seen it. But, but it doesn't reflect these, these customs and it doesn't reflect a more excellent way. That's why we at National Community Church have in our manifesto that we want to be known more for, for what we're for than what we're against. We want to love people when they least deserve it and least expect it. We want to grow more so we can give more. And we want to make Jesus famous. We don't want to make National Community Church famous. We also don't want to promote our way as the only way or the best way. It's about Jesus and people being invited into a thriving and growing relationship with him. As our pastor of prayer, Pastor Heidi would say, we, we want to we wanna engage and minister in the opposite spirit of what we see going on around us. So Paul is writing this letter because he didn't like what he was, what he was seeing, what he was hearing uh, that was happening in Corinth. It was too much of a Corinthian reflection and not enough of a Christ-like reflection. So if I can put this in legal terms, uh, Paul is writing a nice cease and desist letter. <laughs> but he doesn't just tell them to stop what they're doing. He also tells them how they should proceed. So as we close this, this three-part series, um, three remain. We're going to zoom in on love this weekend. The first two weeks, Pastor Mark taught us about faith and hope. He said faith is our credit card, hope is our greeting card, and love is our calling card. But just before chapter 13, I, I want to just touch on chapter 12 because it's, it's related as to why Paul is writing about love. Uh, in chapter 12, Paul is addressing spiritual gifts, and he's also addressing unity and, and diversity. And the reason for this is because there was a misinterpretation, a misuse, and a miscategorization of these gifts. And part of the reason why they were missing it is because uh, the gifts were not about them, but they were making it about them. The gifts were not to be ranked. They, 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 they shouldn't be used to one-up the other person. And this is what they were doing. He also said that the gifts were part of one body that should work in concert together. He, he uses this metaphor of the human body and, and its different parts being the body of Christ and how they should work well together. And so Paul is explaining all of this and he's laying this foundation and he's making it clear about the gifts saying, hey, I don't want you guys to get this confused, but, 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 but hold up just one second. Just put that to the side. Let me explain to you an even more excellent way. So then we arrive at chapter 13, and one of the things that I love is orchestra music. And so uh, N.T. Wright says that uh, the tone and the tenor and the key shifts like a movement 
uh, in a symphony in chapter 13. This would be like the slower movement where it would seem like it's a different song. It would seem like it's a standalone and it's not, even though we tend to treat it that way. An example would be weddings. This is one of the, the, the favorite wedding passages that we hear read. Not that that's a problem, but I want us to understand the fullness of what Paul is teaching. Verses one through three, Paul is, is comparing love to the things we often take, take pride in and saying that love is, is greater. Verses four through seven, he's saying, uh, what is love and, and its, its properties and its fruits. And then in verses uh, 8 through 13, as he closes, he talks about the superiority of love. Now, there's a lot of different things that I wanted to share with you tonight, a lot of things I wanted to dive into, but I think I can only uh, summarize or I have enough time to summarize what Paul is saying in two points. So just bear with me for a few more moments. Number one, point number one, I think Paul is telling us in what he's writing to the church at Corinth is that love is about orientation, not outcome. See, I I think in the society that we live in, we're so focused on outcomes and we're so focused on results because that's how we measure. That's how we give weight. That's how we give value. But Paul is saying, listen, that's, that's not God's rubric. God is concerned about the orientation of our hearts, first and foremost. It doesn't mean that the results don't matter, but you could be doing the right thing for the wrong reason. And this is actually what was happening uh, at the church in Corinth. Um, There's a book called Love Does by Bob Goff. Maybe you've heard of it before, but uh, to open the book in chapter one, uh, Bob Goff is writing about this guy named Randy that he met when he was in high school. And so Bob is in high school and uh, he meets this guy, Randy. He's trying to figure out, like, why this older guy is hanging out with all these high school people. And, and so he gets to know Randy, and he finds out that Randy is a part of a group called Young Life. And part of Young Life's mission is to hang out with young people, primarily at schools, and, and engage them with the gospel. And so he gets to know, uh, Randy gets to know, oh, gets to know Bob, and, and uh, he, he shares the gospel with Bob, and Bob is not too interested, but they begin to, to, to build a relationship, and Randy is just consistently there and consistently showing up, and so Bob is not really having a great time in high school. Things are not really going that well. He's, he's, he's not getting in trouble, but he's not really excelling. He's not really loving school, and it's not going that great, so Bob makes the decision that he's going to drop out of high school, and he's going to move to Yosemite, and he's going to have this life uh, of adventure because he's just got to leave this high school thing behind him. But before he leaves, he says, I'm going to swing by Randy's house and I, I'm, I'm just going to knock on the door and, and tell Randy that uh, I'm out. I'm, I'm, I'm rolling. I'm, I'm doing my thing. And so he knocks on the door and, and Randy comes and, and he, he, he's half asleep and, and, uh, and Bob says, hey, listen, I just stopped by to tell you that I'm out, man. I, I'm headed to Yosemite. I'm going to do my thing. I, I got this life of adventure that I want to pursue. School is not really working out for me. And uh, Bob was surprised by Randy's response. Um, Bob, uh, this is Randy's response. He said, Bob, all right, man, I'm with you. Will, will you just give me one minute? Let me just check something out real quick. So he disappears in the house. He comes back a couple minutes later, and he's, he's got his shoes. He's got his bag. And he says, okay, Bob, I'm with you. Um, let, let's, let's roll. I, I can find my way back, you know, after a few days. But, but if it's all right, I'm going I'm to roll out with you. And listen to what Bob Goff said. He said, something in Randy's words rang right through me. He didn't lecture me about how I was blowing it and throwing opportunities away by leaving high school. He didn't tell me um, I was a fool and that my idea would fall off the tracks on the way to the launch pad. He didn't tell me I would surely crater even if I, I did briefly lift off. He was resolute, unequivocal, and had no agenda. He was with me. See, I think this is precisely the point that Paul is trying to make in the opening verses of chapter 13. If I could just remix it to the JMS version, it would go a little something like this. Nobody cares about your languages, your knowledge, your sacrifices, your education. If love is not in the lead position, it's just noise and nothingness. See, Bob eventually made it back to high school. But it it wasn't anything that Randy 
convinced him of, that, that sent them back. It was the orientation of Randy's heart. It wasn't Randy's experience or education or, or accomplishments or authority. That's not what moved Bob. But so often our focus is too outcome focused and, and, and we're, we're focused on what we produce and our titles and our expertise. And Paul is saying that's not the most excellent way. But listen, don't y'all think Randy knew Bob was tripping? <laughs> don't you think don't don't you think that don't you think Bob uh, uh, Randy knew that Bob was making a mistake? Don't you think that Randy knew that if he didn't show up and wasn't present with this kid, he might not have an opportunity to make it back? Yeah, that's right. Don't you think he knew that? Yeah. So they're on their way back from Yosemite, and they show up at Randy's house, and um, Bob gets out the car, and he invites himself in because he feels like he's family now, and he notices <laughs> that the girlfriend's car is there, and she would often visit him. So he's confused because he's seeing presents on the floor. He's seeing, he's seeing paper, wrapping paper, and there are plates in the microwave. And, and he's like, man, these are, these are strange gifts. And, and, and his girlfriend comes around the corner and says, welcome home, honey. And at that moment, Bob realizes that when he knocked on the door the day before, that Randy and his girlfriend had just gotten married. Wow. Wow. And he could not believe that that, that Randy would leave on the weekend that he had just gotten married to go hang out with a high school kid. That's what made Bob return. That's what made the difference in Bob's life. Listen to what Bob said. He said, why? It was because Randy loved me. He saw the need and did something about it. He didn't say he was for me or with me. He was actually present with me. This story is a reflection of God's love for us. John 3.16, sometimes a throwaway scripture for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But listen, it wasn't just that. God inconvenienced himself came down from heaven to be with us. That's why we call him Emmanuel, God with us. He is for us no matter what the outcome. Just like Randy was with Bob, encouraging him, not chastising him. We go on to John 3, 17. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And this is actually what it means to be a Christ follower, to be known by our love not our righteousness, not our morality, not our judgment. It's the orientation of our hearts towards God and others. Jesus talked a little bit about this. Let me tell you what he said. John 13, 34 through 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And oh, by the way, if we got it twisted, he clarified who one another is. Because I think, we think one another is, oh, my people, the people that I like, the people I hang out with, the people I go to church with, the people that dress like me, the people that listen to music like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Listen to what he said. Matthew 5, 43 through 44 and then 46 to 48. He says, you have heard that it was said. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And not even, are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Dang, Jesus, why you had to say that? See, that's a challenge for us. You know why? You know why it's a challenge for us? Because we want to be the Avengers for the gospel. That, that's, 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 that's what we want to be. We want to be defenders of the faith. That, that's, that's, that's what we want to do. And we're more concerned about being right than being in a right relationship. The Corinthians wanted to be right. They wanted to one-up each other. They wanted to one-up the people in, in, their, in their society. Paul is saying, listen, that's not the right orientation. It's, it's, it's wrong. It's not the way this thing should go. I'm sure they love this letter from Paul. <laughs> Number one, love is about orientation, not outcome. Number two, 
Love is about sacrifice, I would say, for others and not selfishness or selfish ambition. December 14th, 2012, Scarlett Lewis sent her son Jesse off to school. It would be the last day that she would see Jesse alive. A shooter entered the school, Sandy Hook, killed six staff members, 20 children. Jesse was one of them. But there was one comfort that Scarlett, his mother, carries to this day from this tragedy. Jesse laid down his life for his friends and his teacher. While the shooter entered the room and ran out of bullets, Jesse told his friends to run while he stayed behind with his teacher. Jesse was six years old. Yeah, just let that sink in for a little bit. Six years old. Inspired by Jesse, Scarlett, his mother, she said, we can't always choose what happens to us, but we can always choose how we respond. And we can always respond with love. See, this, at this point right here, this is where I kind of I, I had to have a keep it real moment after I read this. And I, I, I said, is this not a justifiable moment of selfishness? Is this not a moment where a mother who has lost her son can be angry, can be frustrated, can, can be mad at the world? Is this not? Because no one would think of Scarlett differently if she felt that way. No one would think less of Jesse, a six-year-old, if he had run like everybody else. Because our very nature is about selfishness and self-preservation, we would excuse that. We walk around saying, who owes me? Who wronged me? Who has more than me? Who looks better than me? Who likes me? Who rejected me? Our motivations and how we respond, our decisions are often motivated by this self-focused nature that we have. And Paul is saying to us in the church in Corinth, it's the wrong starting point. I would remix the next verses, four through seven of the same chapter. And if we turned it around on us, it would read, when it's about us, We are not patient. We are not kind. We envy. We boast. We dishonor. We are self-seeking. We are easily angered. We keep records of wrong. We keep records of wrong. I had to circle that one for myself. We delight in evil and reject the truth. We protect, trust, hope, and preserve only ourselves. Paul says it's not the excellent way. And see, the reason why we are overwhelmed and overcome by unconditional love is because it goes against the very nature of who we are. We, we can't necessarily wrap our heads around it. But I tell you what, I bet we will make more friends. I bet we will be better neighbors, better spouses, better parents, have, have better influence if we sacrifice more for the sake of others instead of ourselves. I'm not talking about charity that you check off a list. I'm talking about sacrifice that really costs you something. I'm talking about standing by a friend that's in trouble, even though it might cost you your reputation because you're associated with them. I'm talking about choosing to forgive, which forfeits the sympathy that comes along with being a victim. Listen, it doesn't mean we don't hurt. It doesn't mean we're not frustrated. It doesn't mean we don't have concern. It doesn't mean we don't don't feel uncomfortable. But what it means is, is that we trust the power of God's love to transform. That's what it means. And when we're selfish, we're standing in the way of God's love, transforming our hearts and those around us. Let me see if I can bring this to a close. Um, This past week, our staff was on a retreat, and it's one of my favorite times of year. You know, we, we get together with our families, and we hang out for a couple of days, and we're out on the water, and, you know, just... Just, just taking some time to relax. And uh, I don't really know how to relax that, that well, so I got to do active stuff. So I brought my bike with me because uh, that helps me relax and, and go on rides. And I haven't been able to ride for a little bit. And um, so I found out a couple, couple of folks with us um, 
Steve Martin, who's on our staff, and his wife, Bonnie, um, you know, has, has served us as well. She's part of our pastoral care team. And um, found out that they cycled. They brought their bikes. And uh, so I said, hey, let's, let's get up. Let's, let's go get a few miles in. And so Bonnie shows up, and she's got this neon jersey on, and she's ready. I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> and um, so I get out, and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going. And uh, Bonnie, she, she's like the energizer bunny. She takes off, and Steve is doing his best to, to keep up you know, with her. And, and, and as time goes on, I'm just lacking further and further behind. And uh, I'm, I'm starting to get tired because my conditioning is not where it needs to be. I should be further along, but haven't been able to ride and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating in my mind when and where I'm going to quit, you know. <laughs> um, you know, OK, when I get to this point, I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn back around. And, and but I would get to that point and then I would just keep going and I would get to the next point and, and, and I would and I would just keep going. And then we were on our way back. We were on the way back, and, and, and at some point, I lost sight of Bonnie. I lost sight of, of the neon jersey, um, and I, I, I just had this thought while I was riding. That, you know what? This is like a picture of our relationship with Christ. You know? His love is way out in front of us, compelling us, leading us, charting the course. And sometimes we see him. You know, sometimes we can't. And we're doing our best to keep up. And it's hard and, and we want to quit sometimes and our spiritual conditioning is just not where we maybe will want it to be. And we're saying, Jesus, I want to follow you, but I don't know if I can love my spouse again. Jesus, I, I, I want to be a reflection of you, but I don't know if I can forgive my parents. Jesus, I want to be your disciple, but I don't know if I can bless this boss who keeps persecuting me. Jesus, I want to be a kind neighbor, but I know it won't be reciprocated. See, at Calvary and on the cross, Jesus knew that we lacked the capacity in our own strength to live out this kind of love. Love is not the most excellent way because it's easy, it's smooth, or it produces the results that we hope for. It's not the case. But Paul tells us that it's the only thing that will last. He says prophecies, language, knowledge will cease and be silenced and pass away. He's trying to help us understand that these gifts and these different things that we desire and we pursue won't produce what we hope it would in our lives. They will become irrelevant at some point, but only love remains. And I think if Paul was preaching this message this weekend, he would say people will fail us. Policies will fail us. Government will fail us. Education will fail us. There's nothing that we can acquire or produce that won't fail us at some point. That's not the case for love. That's not the case for God's love for us and Jesus' sacrifice for us. So this weekend, we're going to close this series by celebrating communion. I'm going to ask our hospitality leaders at all of our locations to get in place to get ready to serve us. Because this is a reminder of God's sacrificial love for us through Jesus. There's a song written by uh, James Cleveland, an old song that says he decided to die. There's a line in the song that says he would not come down just to save himself. And then Jesus said in John 10, 18, no one takes it from me. He's talking about his life. I lay it down on my own accord. Love lays down agendas, lays down pride, selfish ambition, conceit, because Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let's pray. God, that was a lot for us to unpack this weekend. And we could do an entire sermon series and not even scratch the surface of unpacking your love for us. God, help us to, one, accept the love that you have for us, that you've given through your son, Jesus. And if there's anyone among us who hasn't accepted that love, God, I pray right here in this moment. And if that's you as I'm praying, you can say, I want to receive that and you can receive it. It's just that simple. God, I pray that you would do a new thing and those who are just coming into a relationship with you, I pray that you would do a new thing for those of us who have known you. God, take us to another level. Help us to be known for our love, not our arguments. 
Help us to be known for our love, not what we are against. Help us to be known for our love, God, so that we can draw people closer to you and we can share what it means to really love. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst. And we ask for more of your spirit because we don't have the capacity within ourselves to love. So we need more of your spirit to help us love and be a reflection of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.